Moving to the next source of income. Moving on, the next income source is... And the next income source is... All right, moving on to the next source of income. Moving on to the next source of income. The next source of income is... What's going on, everyone? Lullet here. When it comes to income and income sources and how many I've built over the years, is definitely a contribution of the folks you just saw, as well as countless others from right here within the financial space of YouTube. If you had the power to go back in time and you found me and told me, hey, in the future, you're gonna have this many income sources, I, I would have never believed you. But after years of studying others, learning from them, and implementing strategies along the way, and repeating that whole process, I'm here able to make this video in order to hopefully streamline your same effort towards this same goal or even further. We got a good bit to get into, so appreciate you spending this time together as a thank you from myself to you. Big, big shout out to you watching right now. So with that, all right, let's do it. Starting this off, we got the stock market. And for our purposes, it's only one source of income, but there's actually multiple ways to make money in the stock market, both actively as well as passively. For the active income made from the stock market, I love to say I'm a day trader, but just given how my time is spent on other streams of income as well, it's not necessarily the case. But that being said, I do make capital gains from the buying and selling of stock, whether that's short term or long term, as well as income through trading options and on the buying side as well as the selling side where I'm collecting premium for a quote unquote passive income as well. So moving to the purely passive income side of the stock market and streams of income, we're talking about it, probably you guessed it, it's dividends. From real estate investment trusts to master limited partnerships to closed end funds, as well as your blue chips, of course, in the dividend investing world, there's a concept known as DGI, which stands for dividend growth investing. So there's a separate portfolio that I maintain for that type of purely passive income. When it comes to dividends from the stock market, it's the truest form of passive income I've experienced in my entire life. If you're thinking of getting involved in the stock market, it's supremely easy the way technology is set up today. And so feel free to check out the links in the description below where you get one, two, or even more free stocks by just signing up for a stock brokerage platform. What you gotta know is be wary of the fake gurus. Be aware of those folks that never lost a trade in their life. And of course, the obvious gut rich quick schemes. But moreover, just given how the stock market in the long term only goes up, so you have long-term investing kind of taken care of, and in the short term, just so many different other ways to milk money from the market and make gains and afford a certain lifestyle and just contribute to your whole net worth, the stock market for me is definitely one of my sources of income and one of my favorite sources of income in general. Moving on, the next source of income is cryptocurrency. Similar to the stock market, you're talking capital gains from the buying and selling of assets and coins, such as your Bitcoin, Ethereum, but also a ton of other altcoins. And the beauty about the cryptocurrency market, unlike the stock market, where it's open from 9.30 a.m. and closes at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you got cryptocurrency running 24-7. In addition to capital gains, we're talking dividends equivalent, but in cryptocurrency, and it's known as staking rewards. And another way to actually get passive income through cryptocurrency, there's a multitude of platforms which you can check out through different playlists on the channel where you can get interest by holding your cryptocurrency with certain platforms. At the time of this recording, if you have US dollars and a savings account, you're getting most likely below 1% per year in interest in terms of income. But if you have the equivalent of USD, AKA USDC, or something known as a stable coin in the crypto universe, then you could actually be getting interest rates up to 8%, 9%, even 12%, depending on what type of platform you're on. In the stock market, I have income from options, and in crypto, I have the same thing as well from trading options, and it's quite limited in terms of what all you can do, but primarily, at this time, I've been trading options on Bitcoin as well as Ethereum, and there's videos with a step-by-step -step of exactly how to do that and how you can do it too, so feel free to check it out if you're interested. In the stock market, you can take out margin, which is essentially borrowing against your assets. And in crypto, you can also lever your assets, essentially called leverage, where you can borrow X amount, whether that's a certain coin or a certain type of arrangement, depending on your platform, on the fact that you have assets with them. You definitely wanna understand what you're dealing with and understand the risks, I'm not a financial advisor, you know how it is. So that being said, you can borrow against your asset and get outsized gains as well. But at the same time, if you're borrowing and things are taking a tumble, then things can change rather quickly. Regarding crypto, it's been pretty popular of recent, so it's pretty obvious, but avoid the scams and cons, and sometimes they're harder to notice than not. So definitely do your due diligence in general with anything related to crypto. And a final note is basically regulation. The stock market, it's heavily regulated. It's been around for X amount of years, and there's a lot of rules in place from the government top down. But with crypto, it's not such the case. Things are changing rapidly day to day, 
but in general, it's not as regulated as not in the stock market or rather with the US dollar, you have insurances such as FDIC insurance on your checking accounts up to 250K per account, for example. You have SIPC insurance more on the security side, but within crypto, it's not always present. There may be insurance provided by the platforms, but it just depends. So again, do take the time to figure out what you're really doing. Moving on to the next source of income. Real estate. Real estate has its advantages and perks and also the opportunity to make income while you're at it. You have equity, which is the combination of your down payment plus how much you're paying into your mortgage, which is going towards principal. This equity is considered as income because there's other ways to make income from it, where, for example, if you want to tap into that equity and borrow against it to maybe go invest or do the next thing or increase your property value if it makes sense, then you basically are making more than not just by having a mortgage. You also have appreciation, which just by default, the real estate market, similar to the stock market, only goes up in the long term. Definitely there are gonna be your outliers slash other situations, but in general, appreciation is something as well that can be tapped into similar to equity. Last year when I made this sources of income video, I had two more streams of income within real estate and it was essentially still dealing with the same primary residence where I'm recording this video right now. And it was dealing with Airbnb as well as rent hacking. But with everything with the Rony Rona and otherwise, those two substreams of income within real estate have went away. They may come back, but just wanted to put that out there for kind of context of why it's always important to diversify and have multiple income streams. To qualify to buy a home, you usually need two years of tax returns, which essentially are gonna be your income proof as well as credit score. Hence, moving to the next source of income, credit cards. With credit cards, there's sign-up bonuses, but in addition, you can get cash back, points, miles, and otherwise. And although you need to spend to maybe get that 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, depending on the situation and even more, the reality is I'm saving cash I would have spent anyhow through organic spend. So that cash being saved can be go invested in the market and make even more money. In addition to that, you can refer folks to certain credit cards and get a kickback when they sign up and get approved, whether that's in the form of cash or points. And there's some other ways to make money from credit cards, but I'll discuss those towards the end of the video. And regarding what you need to know about credit, apart from the obvious, don't spend money you don't have, don't fall into debt, is really understanding how credit works, specifically your credit score. For example, let's say you apply X amount of times, let's say 10 times. Let's say you're approved for three, four cards and get denials for the other six. The issue is, yeah, your credit score is hurt temporarily for a short term, maybe two months, six months, it just depends. But really, it's not just about these credit cards, it's about other loan products. For example, with a car loan or a home loan, loans that can change your whole financial future, even though that credit score hit is temporary, based on your credit score at that time is how they approve you for your loan. So whether you're going for a $1,000 sign-up bonus in value or $2,000 or even $3,000 of value, when you're looking at a home loan or a car loan, these numbers, they're not even comparable. Having a good credit score and getting that much better of an interest rate could mean the difference of tens of thousands of dollars when it comes to an auto loan, for example. And we're talking about a mortgage over the span of 30 years, we're not talking about just maybe tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but depending on the situation, it could literally mean millions of dollars. All right, moving on to the next source of income. Affiliate marketing. Back in the day when I started learning about all these different ways to make money, Affiliate marketing always came up as the number one source of passive income, and for the life of me, I never knew what it meant. Affiliate marketing, simply put, is the existence of a product, and there being, for example, links in which way this product can be marketed, and you being an affiliate, having a certain link, and when someone signs up, you getting a kickback by marketing this link by yourself acting as an affiliate, hence affiliate marketing. So for example, if you check out the links in the description below, there's certain referral links, whether it's credit cards, stock market apps, cryptocurrency apps, and other financial products, where if you use my link and sign up, I'll get compensated a certain amount. It's definitely not a get rich quick scheme type of situation, it really takes a lot of scale, essentially having an audience who's happy to support you or having content that folks are consuming, whether video, blogs, or otherwise, and over time, basically this income is passive because without your involvement, folks are consuming your content, checking out your links, potentially signing up, and then you getting that kickback. Since posting right here on YouTube for a little more than a year and having a little more than a thousand subscribers, I used to think affiliate marketing was some BS, but fast forward, it's actually a good source of income and it definitely is passive. Those links in the description, they definitely rewarded me more than I ever expected, seriously. Moving on, the next income source is? Beatbox. <laughs>
I've been beatboxing for almost 15 years and you don't need to beatbox that long at all to be at this level of skill. You can definitely do it with a lot less time. That being said, in terms of the actual streams and sources of income within beatbox, I went into a much deeper dive in one years ago video of this similar topic. So feel free to check it out because what I realize is that it's such a specific thing that let me say it this way to kind of bring the point home. It's one of my childhood passions where I never expected it to be a long-term income source and me to make and talk about it right here, right now. So what I'm getting at is if you're passionate about something, have something that's creative or in the arts field or something that doesn't have an X dollar payout by doing XYZ task, what I would say is definitely take that shot figure out how you can monetize it, look at other videos, whether it's on YouTube, learn from others, but there's definitely not just a way to make money from whatever you're doing, but there's a way to monetize that same skill and then scale it and maybe it becomes its own company or something on its own and maybe just defines your life a certain way. Because with beatboxing, my whole life has changed, not just because of the skill and the art, but literally the folks that I'll meet along the way and what I'll learn from them and fast forward to today, there's so many other streams of income which have definitely come from beatbox. And the biggest thing, similar to the gym, it's kind of this discipline where I'm sure that if you're passionate about something, maybe you have that discipline whether you realize it or not. So if you can achieve one thing, you can use that same type of spirit or that rigor, determination, commitment, whatever it is, on achieving that next set of tasks or whatever you're aiming to do. Moving on, the next income source is... Management Consulting. Day to day, this job can vary supremely, and there's no one real quote unquote definition for every single activity that a management consultant does. At the highest level, you can find management consulting as essentially us giving advice to upper level management, inclusive of the C-suite for Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100, and in that top echelon of company, whether public or private. All of the potential approaches slash solutions we offer to management is essentially in the end of the day to achieve some type of strategic initiative, whether that's in the outlook of next year or two years from now, all the way up to five years or 10 years or even more, it just depends on the nature of the industry. To be a management consultant can either mean you're an independent contractor where you build a client directly hourly and you'd be getting paid based on the number of hours you worked for that client. On the other hand, you can also be a full-time employee with a certain firm and the firm would collect the billable hours that you bill to the client in terms of their revenue and then you'd be given a salary. When you earn a salary, you have a cap on how much you earn every single year. You do have bonuses, you do have perks, and kind of fringe benefits that come along with the profession. But in the end of the day, you may be able to earn more when you're an independent contractor and billing directly to the client. Being an independent contractor usually means you don't have benefits when you're talking about health insurance and otherwise when you're actually typically with a company. And so it's a give and take relationship. To be independent may sound great in one way, but at the same time, when you're out of college, for example, or even a few years out, in the end of the day, to be a consultant means to have some type of basis or foundation in a certain subject matter. And there's a typical term called SME, which stands for subject matter expert. This all goes to say that in theory, anybody can be a consultant, but to be an effective management consultant and have the command to bill a certain hourly rate directly to the client, it definitely takes some experience and some command of your actual industry or the subject matter at hand. To become a management consultant, you'll generally need a college degree. But let's say you don't have one, you can get in, let's say if you know someone directly working with a client and their team, but generally speaking, the bigger the firm, in terms of your Fortune 500 and 100, they try not to work directly with the smaller teams and independent contractors. It'll usually be with bigger firms in the consulting space. With these bigger firms, you'll need a college degree generally. At the same time, if you have a portfolio that speaks to your expertise and what type of history or track record you have, then definitely there are exceptions that can be made. In the end of the day, if you work under a consulting firm, their business is essentially advertising your skill set to the client and saying, hey, we can add value in X, Y, Z type of manners with this type of resource. And so the more hours you bill to the client, the more the actual firm gets paid, and then there could be a tie up with your bonus at the end of the year, depending on how many hours you bill to the client. A few items that come up when you search up management consulting are definitely gonna be your five star hotels, your first class flights, your three Michelin star meals, all paid for on the expense account of the client. And it sounds great at first, trust me, it is, and it's great. But at the same time, it's not gonna be your nine to five type of job or hey, you know, can I just take this day off whenever I want? Because in the end, you really are following the schedule of the client. What this means in a practical sense is that for a company, they're full-time employees and they may work that nine to five schedule, let's say. Us as consultants, depending on the goal or kind of the strategic objective of our overall project, it basically is to understand their nine to five and then dig a little deeper 
And during the day, maybe we don't get to all that work. And so there are definitely late nights or after five o'clock type of sessions that definitely come into the picture. And it's more common than not all across the board. It may sound like a generalization and some projects may be more chill or more easy. And in management consulting, it really is projects, whether they're 12 weeks, kind of to assess a certain situation. And then maybe there's an execution plan, which may go a year out. So for example, I may be on a 12 week engagement to figure out, hey, what are kind of the gaps, the pain points of a certain process or a certain type of objective we're trying to align with, with the client. And then from there, because I was a part of the engagement and understand the ins and out up to that point, I may be on the same project to execute everything that happens afterwards in that one year roadmap after the fact. If everything I'm talking about over here sounds like gibberish so far, it's all good. I haven't talked about management consulting as a career or profession on the channel. So if you want to hear more about that, do comment down below. Happy to make videos on that because in the end of the day, it's definitely a way to earn income. And right after your IB or being, for example, a petrochemical engineer and those type of skill sets, management consulting is definitely up there in terms of your income, whether it's straight out of college or in general from a career path perspective. So from there, moving on. So we talked about seven sources of income, but this is kind of the eighth source slash all of the random side hustles kind of clumped into one. So starting off, we got checking account bonuses. With checking account bonuses, there are also bonuses when you open a savings account, for example. Maybe you've seen the targeted offers come in your mail or email. Get $100, get $200, get $300, and sometimes you can get $500, $600 plus. It just depends. But usually these type of bonuses, when you try an account, when you open it up, whether you're talking about Bank of America or Chase or PNC, there's quite a handful. And depending on the state that you're actually located in, there's certain credit unions or certain local offers you can get as well to kind of take advantage of trying new products, but getting paid to try them nonetheless. To get these bonuses, there are usually some requirements. And it could be one, two, or all of the following requirements, as well as some others. So for example, let's say we're trying to open a checking account. It may say, hey, you know, swipe your debit card at least 10 times in a month, as well as maintain a 1500 monthly balance in general. And it could also say, hey, you know, you need to get direct deposit of X amount every single month. And that needs to happen for at least the next 90 days, for example, to get that bonus. It could be any of these, as well as other conditions. Just depends bank to bank, the certain type of account. And usually within a certain bank, there are different types of checking accounts. So there could be different offers depending on that type of account. When it comes to savings accounts, I personally have noticed that they really want a good chunk of money. And the least I've seen is usually around 10K to 15K. And it can go up to, let's say, 75K, something like this, or even more, depending on what type of savings account you're trying to open. The bonuses, they can be, let's say, 600 bucks and maybe even a thousand actually. But at the same time, is it really worth to park your money just for that bonus and to keep switching around? It just depends on the personal situation, but nonetheless, it's a good side hustle to have where you can still make around two to three grand a month, I would say, not a month, a year, but it's definitely doable. In the end, you're just trying out products and if you like it, keep it. If you don't, that's the whole point. It's a user acquisition cost. And if they don't acquire you as a user, there's probably a good reason that they couldn't keep your business. But in the end, you still got paid out handsomely. So I consider it a win-win in the end of the day. Moving on from there, it's flipping products. And flipping these products, it's not really a science around it or me keeping inventory. So I still consider it like a side hustle in the fashion that I'm doing it. But for example, and coming back to the credit card point I was getting to, is combining credit cards with offers they may have. For example, with American Express cards, you have Amex offers. And with Chase, you have Chase offers. So depending on the situation, let's just say you have something like get 10% back at Dell.com up to X amount. Now, truly, if there's demand for that product that you got and you got that 10% back, now, if it's in points, then if you value those points at two cents per point, then that 10% in cash is really worth 20% back. So it depends on your equation. But let's say you got something for 100, but in the back end, let's just say you got 10 bucks and you value that as 20. Now, if you can sell that $100 item, let's say at 95 in theory, then you're still making a profit more than not, and you still have the points in the back end in terms of your compensation. It may not be the best example, but in theory, if it's a $1,000 product, then you can kind of see the numbers and how they change. And when you do this in a volume type of manner, if you do it four, five, six, ten 10 times, it kind of adds up in a way. So it's still side hustle type of money, but still money nonetheless. Another one that's been picking up, especially because of right here on YouTube, is definitely the one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. So from personal finance, stocks, crypto, options, kind of stuff we just talk about depending on the individual, basically that's been picking up. So that's been a good kind of income source. So just wanted to share that here out with everyone. When it comes to these income sources and making it a reality and being quote unquote successful or profitable in them, 
this is kind of what it looks like. When it comes to stocks and crypto, I would say it's money and time. The time is really where I've been in the market for almost 10 years here, and whether it's stocks or crypto, although you can say the skills are interchangeable, you're still trying to learn whether from the get-go or whatever knowledge you have, and then building upon it, building upon it, and identifying what type of investor are you. Are you more on the day trading type of way, or are you more a value investor? Or are you looking at the stock market as purely passive income through maintaining a dividend growth portfolio, for example? There's no right answer, but time definitely is important. Because the way I used to invest in the beginning when I was with the market and how I do things today and how I'm seeing the outlook as I'm learning even more things within the stock market with different strategies and different this and that and the other, definitely time is supremely key. And the money part, I don't think I need to explain it, but my only thing is there's a lot of paper trading that you can do and say, oh my gosh, I would have made a million dollars and that's fantastic, but what do you have to show for it is the question you're gonna get from everyone else. So frankly speaking, investing that dollar or $10 or 100 or whatever it is to get started and then actually go on that path and see what that feeling is like of, oh my gosh, my account's down or this is how I feel when you know, I put 100 bucks in, but I'm only gonna get, let's say, 95. Does it affect you? Does it not? So it's really more understanding about yourself through using the same money as a tool to make basically more money. So money, it's not just, oh, it takes money to make money and that type of adage, but really it's using money to understand more about yourself and what type of investor you really want to be. When it comes to real estate, I would say the biggest thing is credit and income. So if you don't have a stable income where you're getting that paycheck every so often, or at least tax returns that show that, hey, you have two years of stable income, then that's the biggest thing that will stop you from actually moving on to the next step. And I understand there's items like OPM where you have other people's money where you can leverage their money to lock in some type of deals. You have wholesaling in real estate, you have flipping in real estate. There's a million different ways to make money in real estate, but at the highest level, Income is one of the biggest things if you want to be alone slash not really with the partner and credit is definitely going to get you there where you need at least some type of credit average or even better is better for you in terms of a requirement because if you have bad credit then you won't even be able to get those loans. You can have 10 million in the bank or even 100 million cash but when you need to have a loan and actually perform your duty to the bank they're just not gonna give you one. Coming to credit cards, similar to real estate, it really is your credit and your credit score. But I would say the best thing you can do is get a card at 18 years old, and if you can't get an unsecured card, get a secured card, just start that train to get your credit score going and naturally maintain it and everything afterwards. But just starting, if you don't have a credit score or at least fixing your situation if it's not looking so hot right now, that's the primary key of what you need to do, whether it's credit cards, real estate, or anything related to credit. Beatboxing, it's one of my passions. But at the same time, let's say you also have that type of art or creative type of aptitude towards a certain skill, and you're wondering, hey, how can I monetize that? So there's some older videos on the channel where it's like beatbox and money combined. When I started making new videos about how can I combine these two subjects to kind of teach the greater community and kind of more the artists and creatives out there and musicians alike. So do check those out. Hopefully they give you some value. It may not be a one-to-one -one match, but kind of ideas to understand that there's so many different types of streams of income. And if you look at my last year's video, I definitely go into more detail on this beatbox perspective. And you can kind of see there's so many other ways than just doing the art specifically when you're performing in that given time, quote unquote, active income. Management consulting, high level, it's not for everyone. It's not your typical day job. At the same time, if you want to get into it, there's a ton of resources that are not on this channel currently that you can just Google how to become a management consultant. And they kind of give you a checklist, what you need to know, do's and don'ts, you know, whether that's in the networking angle, your resume perspective, education perspective, what you're really trying to do, how do you tell your story, why you want to do it, et cetera, et cetera. The miscellaneous section is stuff I like to do anyways, so maybe some ideas for you to consider, but in terms of what future incomes I'm looking at potentially, they're as follows. YouTube, I'm not monetized yet. I love making these videos, so I'm getting there. So you need a thousand subscribers, which we're there, so thank you for subscribing. 4,000 watch hours, we're almost there, so let's see, soon enough. So that's one stream of income. And the second one is Skillshare, not sponsored by them, but I've been looking at a niche of just creating beatbox tutorials, and whatever happens with that, that can be a form of passive income, and so once it's up there, it's kind of up there, and whatever happens from there, uh, we'll see. And if things go well uh, or not, I'll still report uh, back accordingly. So I just wanted to share that as well of what the current sources of income are, what we're looking at, and with that, thanks for coming to the end.